Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Emancipation Lecture. As you know, we're going through Emancipation 2021 under the theme Afro-Artistic, and today we have our lecture on British reparations for Caribbean slavery. And we have a distinguished panel that you will hear from early, but before we start, let us do the national anthem and prayer led by Cultural Officer Carlton Henry. Isle of beauty, Isle of splendor, Isle to all so sweet and fair. All must surely gaze in wonder at thy gifts to reach and rare. as valleys, hills and mountains, all these gifts we do extol. Healthy lands, all like all fountains, giving cheer that warms the soul. Let's all remain standing. Most high and eternal Father, as we gather here today, though the numbers may be small, but the discussion is going to be great. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to empower our panel, panelists as they all will um, aspire to do a very good job. We know they have a lot of information to bring across, Heavenly Father. Let it be heard by, by heirs who are willing to listen, also by persons who are willing to take in every bit of information that they're going to um, give to us today, and not just listen and take it in, but actually act on it. Heavenly Father, allow us to appreciate the freedom that we have here today that some of our forefathers could not appreciate. Let us realize that we are blessed to be living in a country or in a world where we are free to do what we want, say what we want, move around how we want, Heavenly Father. Let this discussion be powerful, let it be empowering, let it be something that may help us to change our attitudes towards the freedom that we have, Heavenly Father. And just let everything that we do be reflecting you and reflecting the betterment of a better Dominica. We make this prayer for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the media. We have GIS Kyrie FM in the house. And um, I would like to also welcome the, the Craft Association. And um, what I would like to do now before I hand over to the moderator is to just give a little information on the emancipation celebrations. Um, last week, we started with the launch. That was last week, Monday. But on Friday, we had our first African dress day. And that went very well. We had some participation. And we're looking to do it even bigger this week and next week. So every Friday leading up to emancipation day, we have African dress day. Also, on um, Saturday the 24th, we have Afro Artistic, the event. And that is based on the, the theme of emancipation. And that event will see a representation of emancipation, not based on the, the enterprise of slavery, as we say, but based on our Africanness, a celebration of the artistic side of our Africanness. And we're looking to express that through music, dance, fashion, drumming, lapokabwit, and so on. And we'll feature two contemporary artists as well, which will be um, Sheldon Alfred Shelley and cultural ambassador Wayne Benjamin. That's Mr. Benji. So come out and support the event. It's free on Friday, on Saturday, sorry. Um, COVID protocols will be observed, of course, and we're asking you all to come out and support in numbers. Thank you very much. I hand over to the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Matthew, and good evening to everyone. Um, first of all, let me apologize for the late start. Um, as we in here know, um, there's a traffic, not a, a traffic jam, basically, that stretches from, from here right back to um, Pottersville. And uh, it's not any accident, it's just the police doing some routine checks um, on licenses, for sure, and maybe other things as well. 
So we apologize for the late start. And um, we, we're happy that the media is here in full force. Um, I think we want to disseminate some information, and that's the way to do it through the media. Kyrie FM, GIS, um, who else is there? Just Kyrie FM and GIS. Let me commend the Cultural Division for, and the Reparations Committee for putting this panel together this evening. And at the same time, let me congratulate Mr. Matthew, who has been appointed um, Chief Cultural Officer. Um, there is an acting to it, but as far as I'm concerned, concern, once you're appointed, you're in the position, and you're free to do what the position calls you to do. So um, the acting is just to remind you that you will have to work a little harder. <laughs> so having started late, we don't want to, um, to prolong the formalities too long. So let me just um, quickly introduce the first speaker um, this evening. As you know, the topic is British reparations for Caribbean slavery. And you know, we have a very strong British history. Um, our first member of panel is, of course, Mr. Lloyd Pascal. If I have to read you his bio, um, I think we take too much time because we already lit quite a, a, an extensive bio. Um, but I can briefly say that um, he has a master's in forestry engineering. He has served at the, at the Environmental Coordinating, Coordinating Unit for a long time. Um, he has been ambassador um, to, to Japan. Um, he has been on the Wheeling Commission as well for, for some time. So he has a wide experience um, in terms of um, his professional um, service up to this point in time. So with these few words, let me introduce Mr. Lloyd Pascal as our first bowler this evening. Somebody may say the first batsman, but I prefer to bowler because when you're bowling, you are more aggressive. So Mr. Lloyd Pascal, please welcome him, please. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, Ambassador Felix Gregoire, members of the head table, presenters, uh, panelists, Ambassador Damian Dublin, Dr. Damian Dublin, and uh, Ms. Hyacinth, Dr. Hyacinth. Um, I'd like to also greet the new um, cultural, chief cultural officer. I thought um, it was a good, very good gesture for him to start with, with this emancipation ceremony, I see it's a celebration. I will try my best if there is a celebration to celebrate, but you know, I am not sure if I am convinced that we have much to celebrate, except we need to commemorate these days. Uh, the media people who are here, the audience, um, small as it is, I think we may have a, a larger audience um, uh, virtually online. And so I want to say good evening to everybody. And um, usually, I, I used to play cricket at one time when I was younger. And um, it's not always a nice feeling to be the first to bat. It might be better to bowl first, you know. But if you have to bat first, you know, you go down in the wicket and you watch, you are surrounded by 11 men, one fast bowler, and um, there are times when your, your stomach try to manage itself to see if it can arrange. And so, um, bear with me, I, I am not, I'm not so used to, to this kind of things, of doing things first and so on. I like to listen to people talk and 
see how I can fit in. But I'm very pleased, I'm very pleased to be invited to, to this occasion, this um, activity. We um, are commemorating the emancipation of slavery, which is something for all of us. Um, we, it seems to me that all of us who are here today are descendants of African, enslaved Africans maybe, or maybe some other choices, but I mean, the reason why we are here is because some of our, of our relatives, of our ancestors, of our foreparents were uprooted from the mother colony and um, taken here by force to work, to work for, yeah, under really rough conditions in something that we call slavery. And so, um, uh, my, my topic is to talk about um, the history with dates of how this thing began, uh, how, how they started this thing. Um, so we, we need to speak about what concerns us in this thing, and that is the, the British Empire. The British Empire at one time, I mean, the British Empire boasted of large territories around the world, in fact, um, some of us will remember that they said that the sun would not set, would never set on the British Empire. Because, you remember that? Uh, like, of course, because, you know, the British people had territories, they had dominions, they had colonies, they had protectorates, they had mandates. And so, they, they, they were in North America, from Canada and Alaska, all the way to India and to South Africa. And so, there are times when people are sleeping, like right now, people in India and maybe China and so on are fast asleep. But the sun is here on us. Well, the sun is going down. But we just had a day, a big Wednesday of sunlight and so on. So that is why the British people were boasting. And they had good rights to do that. They had enough territory, they had enough possessions for them to boast that the sun would not set on the British Empire. And then they made us, they forced us to say little recitations like rule Britannia rule. And they forced us to sing um, during the time when we celebrated National Day. We would sing God Save the Queen. Nobody knew what exactly we were talking about. But we stood attention and we sang God Save the Gracious Queen. Long live the noble queen, God Save the Queen. Send a victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us. God save the queen. Anybody remember that here? I can sing those songs. Yeah, man. That is, that is how they trained us. And some of us learned it well. We were very obedient. But uh, some people did not like slavery. And as a result of not liking slavery, they, 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 they did a lot of things to remove themselves from slavery. We, we're talking about Britain, we're talking about Britain, we're talking about the United Kingdom, and we need to know that when we talk about the United Kingdom, we're talking about basically four countries, and that is England, you have Scotland, you have Wales, and you have Northern Ireland, because there was another part of Ireland that was not exactly under the British. So that empire called the British Empire was the largest empire in, in our knowledge of history and so on. By 1913, they're saying that the British Empire controlled over 412 million people, just 23% of the world population. And by 1920, you had a surface area of 35.5 million square kilometers or 13.7 million square miles. So it's a lot of land mass we are talking about. In fact, they calculated that 24% of the total surface of land on the earth was controlled by Britain. So so when, 
I was asked to talk about dates, so I need to say that the first attempt, the foundation for that empire was set beginning in 1949. 1497, I'm sorry, um, it's the same nervous thing that I'm messing with. 1497, and between 1497 and 1583, Britain really conquered the world the way that they wanted. And a lot of the things that they did, let us say 14, in 1496, they ordered one gentleman by the name of John Cabot to set sail to discover a route to Asia, but go across the Atlantic and find Asia. Um, it's a pity we don't have a map of the world for you to see what it is because it's almost you, you think I can oh, sorry, you sorry, think sorry. I can describe what I said? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the thing is, you, you you have the Atlantic Ocean. We ourselves are in the Atlantic Ocean, the other side of the island, like where the hurricanes come and land. This is the Atlantic. So La Plaine, Guatica, Cassibus, and so on is on the Atlantic, rough sea. But um, so so we have the Caribbean Sea here, but. All the way up north, you pass the United States of America, and across that, that ocean, you have the United Kingdom, you have Europe. Europe, no, England wanting to find a way to Asia, because England found out that both Portugal and Spain, they had already gone ahead and claimed territories around the world, and they felt a little jealous, and they decided that 1496, Henry V, that same Henry V, he asked the gentleman, Mr. John Cabot, to go out and discover a route to Asia. Uh, it's just like Columbus that was going out from on behalf of Spain to get a route to India, and he landed in the Caribbean, and he just called it West India and the West Indies. Well, the same thing. The guys were just making errors in their geography and in their navigation, but yet still, the purpose was to conquer lands and to have territories and people under their dominion. So, um, because Spain and Portugal were already making their riches out of that thing, England got into that business by releasing buccaneers and pirates. I mean, they made a, a movie just recently they're called Pirates of the Caribbean. But really, those were the things that England was interested in, to raid the ships that were laden with gold and sugar and cotton and all kinds of riches from the Spanish and the Portuguese. And so they had, you will remember, names like Henry Morgan, Jamaica, Morgan Heritage, and so on. Remember Francis Drake. Remember names like John Hawkins. All of them were knighted by the Queen because every one of them that went out on these kind of expeditions were supported financially and every otherwise by the monarchy of Great Britain at the time. So they're looking for 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 new lands. They, so. We need to also remember that um, there's a, a queen by the name of Elizabeth I who ruled between 1533 and 1603. She lived during that time. She ruled, uh, you know, and she gave a gentleman by the name of Hubert Gilbert, Humphrey Gilbert, to go out. There was also another gentleman ruling England. His name was... James the first, and James the first is also associated with, with us, in something that um, is, is not my intention to ask anybody if they if they know well. But all of us know the Bible. The Bible was translated by a gentleman by the name of King James. That is why we have a King James version of the Bible because um, the King of England ordered. Um, a translation because 
what, well, I don't know what language it was in, maybe Hebrew or some other thing, but they had to put it in, Engl in English because that is one of the things, the instruments that they would use as they entered the lands and the concord and so on. They wanted to make sure that their Bible doctrine was, was left there to put people in, in the obedience that they needed. So um, over all of the work that they did, one of the things that the English did was to establish uh, th their presence in North America. So you had British North America, which consisted of 13 col colonies in the United States of America and, and, and also Canada. Um, so we will remember, I mean, if you look at the United States of America today, they are 50 states. So that means to say when America got its independence in 1776, there were only 13 colonies. How they managed to reach 50, well, these are things that we can do more research on, but they conquered, they fought, they defeated the, the Indians. I don't know if they are Indians there eh, because I thought the Indians were from India, but that's how they teach us. They teach us that the, 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 the indigenous people of North America were Indians, but they were really Americans. They had their own names and so on. It is bad bad teachings of, of English history that make us even today calling them Indians. So um, from, from the, the 1776 when, there, it, 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 became a, it came a time when people were ruled under Britain in, 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 from the time they got there the first time, I said it was 1496, they established their colony sometime later but it reached a point where colonies under Britain of the 13 colonies revolted. They had a civil war. They had, um, they, were not, they were not prepared. Although they are British people, they were, the same people came from England. They, in fact, on that coast, the Atlantic coast of, of the United States of America, New York, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and so on. They had, they called themselves the New England states, the first group of states where they, where they established themselves. So, um, I see people conferring there. Maybe a letter, a little note need to pass to me for me to stop what I say in there. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean. You have enough time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, um, so, I need to mention also the f a few dates when our sister islands in the Caribbean were, were c controlled or colonized by the, by the British. So, you had St. Lucia in 1605, you had Grenada in 1609, you had St. Kitts in 1624, Barbados 1627, Nevis in 1628. Um, so here we are, um, the, the British Parliament, you know, w once Britain controlled those lands, their, their main crop, their main thing was, was, was sugar. Um, they planted cane, sugar cane, and they harvested and processed the cane into sugar. And so they had their movements. Of, of transportation. So Britain uh, made a lot of money for the business of ship um, transportation. They also made a lot of money for the business of banking, for the business of insurance. And, and I mean, they became a very rich uh, European, European um, power. Uh, we, we know that sugarcane was much better managed in Brazil and Cuba, and, 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 and Britain had no control over that. So they preferred to do, use their buccaneers and their pirates to raid those ships because something happened where we had a, 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 a preferential kind of economic arrangement for those islands that I mentioned there. Um, all the territories of Britain in the Caribbean were compelled to 
have only British ships doing their movement of their, of their sugar. So they started using the boats of the Portuguese and the Spanish, but Britain established its law that they are the only ones. So there was a time when the British consumers, the people, the merchants and so on, asked for free trade. I don't know if people can remember something that happened to us with our bananas just recently in um, that we were selling bananas on the British market at a preferential price treatment and then banana growers from Latin America um, decided that because of an organization called the World Trade Organization that they wanted free trade and so when once free trade came into our banana business we lost it. Well, something like that happened. So it was just a matter of history repeating itself that this thing happened to us twice. Um, so um, we have to find a way to, to see how much that we can, we can do, cons consider what happened to Dominica during those times. Uh, you know, between 19, 1715, all the way up to 1763. And 1763 is always a big, na a big date for us in Dominica because that was a date when officially Britain took possession of Dominica. But from 1715 until 1763, it was under France. So we have a very strong French connection. That is why we speak Patois. Um, the, the, so there are a lot of things that we, when we were talking about independence, we were talking about um, dominion of England over Dominica. We spoke about 1763 as the date that England took possession of Dominica. But there were many fights and many wars between England and France to see who would, who would be the controller of Dominica. There was something called the Seven Year War. After it became British, they fought for seven years. So, um, British colonialism was established, and I, I already mentioned that the, the people of the United States of America decided that they could no longer continue to be oppressed by British rule. They were, they were British people controlling 13 colonies in the United States of America, but they decided that they wanted their independence. And I'll read something for you, um, something that all of us know. Maybe you cannot remember it in full, so just bear with me, and I will just read the, the, the base, the foundation upon which the Declaration of Independence of the United States was. And so I just wanted to say also that you have to bear with me that I cannot make this um, presentation just by telling you things that happen to England and to sugar and these things without really making reference to the life that we live in now. So I, I hope the people who invited me here will not feel offended if I really say that um, for me, the kind of person that I am, I cannot just come here and tell you that England did this and that and so on. And, the life we live in today, the Caribbean that we have today, and the things that we need to do for us to get out of that kind of thing. So bear with me. But one thing that we need to know, and every one of us inside here and everybody listening should go back to the Declaration of Independence and remember what the Americans said when they wanted to break away from England. And they said something like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, self that all men are created equal, that they're all endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to serve these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whoever that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying foundations for safety and happiness. Th these were the first people in the world that made that kind of big move to 
break away from colonial domination of one set of people to against another. At that time, remember, it was not black people because these people did this thing in 1776 and all the way all to 1865. That was the time when slavery was abolished. Slavery was abolished in the Caribbean in 1844. But the United States of America kept having their slaves while they said that all men were created equal. You see how clear that thing is? That all men are created equal. And they have certain unalienable rights. Among them is the right to liberty, to justice, to the pursuit of happiness. But that was not for, for the slaves. This, they continued to maintain slavery while they say that white people had rights to liberty. So um, here you have the United States people may give in 27 reasons. 27 reasons. 27 is a lot. I mean, I don't think that um, when Patrick John and them were pushing for independence from England, they asked, they had 27 justifications why they should break away. And so this is to show you that there was always a spirit of humanity that they did not really want to be under bondage. And we, we need to bear that in mind that, um, that um, so, so there, were, there are a few dates now that we need to pay attention to with regards to people who are broken away from, from bondage. And we're talking about the people, for example, the people of, after the United States had its declaration of independence, France did a revolution. And France's revolution was liberté, um, fraternité, and what is the other one? Egality, equality, fraternity. Um, I have those things written there, but anyway. So, the French Revolution came, and then, right there in the Caribbean, for the first time in the history, because I, I know that Dr. Dublin would not ask me to, to speak here without really making reference to the first successful revolution of slaves in the Caribbean because it's based upon their success that we ourselves found courage for us to pursue our own emancipation. And we're talking about the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution that started in 1791 and by 1803, on the 18th of November, 1803, you had the Battle of Vetier where Jean-Jacques Dessalines led the Haitian black people to a formidable, wonderful historical revolution of slaves, establishing the first slave-freed nation in the world. And therefore, when we, when we come here to talk about, about um, our own emancipation, we have to also remember that we did ours because we followed upon what the slaves did. So even during the time when, the, the, you know, the slaves have been fighting, the, the most important thing that also we have to remember is that Napoleon was, Napoleon Bonaparte was the, the strongest admiral or war person in Europe at the time. And he was beaten, he was defeated. We have to also remember that Dessalines men, when one, I, I'm trying my best to try to put that in correct language, but I need to tell you that one of the biggest um, doctrines that Dessalines had to take care of this mischievous European French was, somebody knows me, Coupe tête, Willy Kai. Anybody hear about that already? That is what that is what Dessalines used. They didn't go and um, you know they realized that the kind of things that happened to slaves in Haiti was anti-human. It was atrocious. It was murderous, 
and therefore the only way that they could win that revolution was based upon their lemma of Kupe Tet Bulekai. We, we understand what that means? Kupe Tet Bulekai, Mr. Akpa, no, you don't understand. Well, you know, the <laughs> Kupe Tet is to take the machete and cut off their heads. These Europeans that had come from wherever they came and came to dominate and control the land. And the other thing was to set fire to their mansions and their houses. Um, we're not saying that, we're not saying that, but we cannot remember, we cannot talk about, about emancipation, we cannot talk about freedom and fighting for freedom without, we say, what means that was used to fight. And remember, these Europeans, were, they had a lot of, of modern weapons while the men of this island, they had their machete. Kutla. Um, they got uh, gunpowder, they made guns, they had things also. So um, we, we, we need to come down now, having dealt with that situation, we need to pay attention that something is happening in Haiti, that during the time when, when slaves were revolting, they were revolting every single territory in the Caribbean. It was because things were not good. It was because of the same inhuman treatment that they were getting that they had to do something for themselves to fight back and move out of that kind of situation. So there was never a situation where slaves were so obedient that they agreed that they will stay under, under the domination of the, the British. And so the slaves in Dominica, we have a group of slaves in Dominica that ran away from the plantations. They call themselves Nick Mahon. And um, there are glorious um, things written about our slave Maon, our neg Maon, you have something written by Paul Ipotulu that says your time is done now and I would encourage every one of us listening, watching, and so on to, to get a copy of this. I think there are three books, one by Dr. Lennox Onichich, one by Dr. Thompson Fountain, and another, this one uh, by Paul Ipotulu about the, the trials, this one is about the trials between 1813 and 1814, just that amount of time to wipe out and eliminate people who had lived in the hills in the bush for 40 years, fighting against slavery and colonialism. They eliminate them in one year, just because there were people, black people who were willing to take money and form part of a, 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 a ranger's regiment to go in the fields and search those fellows. There was another, another very um, unfortunate thing that happened to these people. Um, there was two hurricanes in, in 1813. Uh, if people can remember Hurricane David and Hurricane Maria recently, when these forests, beautiful as they are, well secretive as they were uh, to protect people from everything, but when once the hurricane passed, it, denudes the country, breaks all the branches and leaves and so on, and put the people at a very much exposed. The, there was a gentleman that came as governor from um, Grenada, Mr. George Ainsley. Um, these are names that we need to get familiar with because this is the brutal, the worst brutality that ever happened in Dominica's history was to clean up Dominica from, from Maroons on Lake Mawa. There's one anecdote or one story that um, when this gentleman came to Dominica from Grenada, he was, he, he established an amnesty. But that kind of amnesty is either you surrender, give up, come out from the hills and come and get back to the plantation or I will kill you. And uh, not one single Negma or chief obeyed that thing. And there was one chief called Kwashi. So Einstein, Ainsley was so confident about his mission to get rid of them that he sent, there, there was one Negma who left and went back. Voluntarily, he left the, the camp and he went back to the plantation. And so Ainsley used him personally to bring a message to Kwashi. And the guy, the message to tell Kwashi was, if you can get Kwashi and bring his head for me, I will give you 
a thousand dollars. So the guy came and said, you must, you must give up. He told Kwashi, you must give up or we will kill you and bring you your head for, to co collect a thousand dollars. And Kwashi sent, Kwashi killed the guy. Military um, tribunal right there, they killed him for being out of place. And Kwashi sent a message to the same Einstein telling him that he has a thing for a uh, two thousand Two thousand dollars for Kwashi for Einstein head. So remember, this is a white man from Britain, and this is a Negmao in the bush saying, "Well, your offer for you to get me for one thousand dollars is bullshit nonsense. I want your head for two thousand dollars." So remember, that kind of antagonism made things just worse. The, the the guy already was, you know, with his mental problem. The same Eins, Einsley and he eliminated for good. Some of the things that they did, I mean, it's so gruesome. They have, um, they have a, a kind of, of cage that they would put some of those chiefs and hang them in public, put them there alive. And so everybody passing would see a man is hanging on a piece of thing there and dying. So that people seeing those kind of things themselves would not ever venture to run away from the plantations. And they did that. The Dobini market right there in Roseau is there as testimony that even there is a well with clean, fresh water, and the people refused to drink the water because of so many slaves and so many slave owners that were hung there, that were left there to rot. And all over the plantations, anyway, I mean, it's not that, you know, I'm sure other people there will explain to you better about, about Britain and so on, but that we are saying that that is what British colonialism meant in Dominica. That is what we are celebrating when we talk about our forefathers, our ancestors celebrating, well, maybe not celebrate, but commemorating um, emancipation of slavery. It was those kinds of treatment that was meted upon them I mean, we're not even talking about the amount of people. I had the, the, the opportunity to visit the Elminia Castle in, in, in Ghana, in Cape Coast in Ghana. And um, right there, you know, there is a gate of no return where they, they, they put the people inside and there is a gate open to the sea. So when they go through that, there is no return. But also there is a dungeon. There is the slave... The slave, well, the white man was sleeping upstairs, and he, he established his room right where they had the female slaves downstairs. So he would just go down a little step, just go down. And I saw those things. I mean, the same kind of way that we saw in our history books, they told us that they packed people like sardines on the ship to send them here. I saw those things there, while, right there in the castle. And these gentlemen, these white people, they would sleep with a different lady every night, everyone. They impregnated them. That is how they have Chabin and Mulatto and so on and so on. People would cross the Atlantic pregnant as a result of that kind of sexual activity, predator sexual activity that happened right there in the, in the, in the castle, in the slave dungeon. And so... I say those things to say that when we, uh, maybe we can figure out how many years it was between 1834, there was a proclamation passed in the parliament in England in 1833, and it had to take effect, so it was August 20th, 1833, and it took effect on the 1st of August, 1834. So when you hear about our thing, it, it, it also was, there were, there were various issues that really caused Britain to accept because there, there was strong pressure in England itself. There were religious people, there were people who were against slavery. There were some, some of, the, of the slaves in Canada had already got their freedom and there was, there, but also there was an, an economic challenge that sugar was not really making the money that England wanted, and they wanted to shift 
we, we, one of the things that they had asked me to talk about was how the British Empire made their money. The British Empire, one of the things that they thrived upon was, was cotton. You see, we have cotton shirts all of our cotton fabric. Britain made the most money in the world on that cotton trade business. They got cotton from South Africa, they got cotton from India, they got cotton from, and um, they got cotton from the Caribbean also. They got a lot of cotton from the United States of America. And they would manufacture textile and clothing and send it to P Portugal. They would trade in uh, Africa. So when they would go down for them to, to get some slaves to bring to the Caribbean, they would bring uh, cloth material. They would give it to them and they would get their slaves. They would come across, go to the Caribbean, take sugar and whatever else they would go in. But shipping insurance, I mentioned that before, these two areas that, that, um, that um, made a lot of money for England. I don't want to stop, I don't want to finish without mentioning it. I, I, I am profusely um, sorry if I offend anybody, but you need to know that the church, particularly at the time, the Church of England, the Catholic Church, they all came together and they used obedience of Christianity to make slaves. And you can see several quotes in the Holy Bible that this gentleman, um, King James, King of England, to make slaves obedient, just be obedient to your master just as you are obedient to Jesus Christ, to, to the Father, just quotes of that nature. That, um, and I can tell you, the conditions that the Caribbean is in today, we have a situation that needs uh, our own attention and our own solidarity with the people of Haiti. The people of Haiti just lost a president, but the president was a puppet. He was not serving the people of Haiti, because in Haiti right now, today, there is a, an organization called a core group. The core group is composed of the embassies of the United States of America, um, the European Union, Canada, France, Brazil, and the Organization of American States. And those are the people that control government in Haiti. We must know that. Because we sit here in Dominica and we pretend, oh, these Haitians, they just come around us and they just disturbing us in our nice, comfortable Dominica. But the Haitians are running away from a kind of suppression, from a kind of military occupation that was even by the United, States, the United Nations. The United Nations sent military people in Haiti in 2004, and they brought cholera, a place that never had cholera. The United Nations introduced cholera, and up to today, talking about from 2004 to today, several thousand people were killed with, from this cholera. And the United Nations has refused to pay a single cent for compensation. While we're talking about reparations for Haiti, or for us, because we talk about reparations to, from Europe and so on, we need to also lend solidarity with Haiti. Not only do France owe them reparations for what they did, in colonialism, but also the United Nations owes reparation to Haiti for what they did with this cholera. And not only cholera, the people who were the soldiers that were there on behalf of the United Nations impregnated so many children. And a lot of it was sex for money, transaction sex. And we, we are now as they, you know, they, they kill the president. Boy, they make a coup in Haiti and they kill the president. But it's not just that. We have to learn solidarity with the Haitian people, just as we ourselves have to pay attention to what is going on with us in Dominica. We have to learn solidarity with the people of Cuba. The Cubans people have a situation that need a, a, a resolution. The Haitian people. And so we are, we are witnessing a new era of, of, of an uprising and 
killing a president and the same people who killed him are the ones that replaced him and so on there. The same people who participated in the killing of President Juvenel Moise are the same ones that are making a new government they, 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 from the same, you know, they have a party there. They have a party in Haiti that was ruled first by Michel Martelly, Sutmiki. People remember Sutmiki? Yeah. Sutmiki. Sutmiki is a guy, a, a very, I mean, he has very bad ways. Sutmiki would go on stage with, with women underwear and undress to let people see his women underwear he, he wearing. And dance. Sutmiki is the, was the head of a party called, let, let me write it for him to remember it. Party Aisien Tetkali. Hmm? PHTK. PHTK. You can Google it. PHTK. Sweet Mickey was the head of that thing when, after they removed Aristide and, and the earthquake happened, um, Preval was the president, Preval got sick and so on after the earthquake. They installed Sweet Mickey as president. Sweet Mickey came here, you know, after he, be, he left presidency and cursed everybody in the Windsor Park Stadium and tell them that the Prime Minister is his friend, so he don't have no problem. He apologized, but I mean, the damage was done. He was a president of a country. But what I'm saying the, the, is that, yes, he was a very low-grade kind of person that he was imposed upon the people. Because they had a, a primary, they had an election, and Sweet Mickey came out third or fourth in the election. The, the second round of the election are the only two people, the first and second person. Sweet Mickey was neither first nor second, yet still, the Americans imposed him that he should be on the second round, and they got him to win. So, in the Haiti, the Constitution said that you can only rule for one term. So, Sweet Mickey comes out of the party, but he put another Ted Kale as his, um, his recommending. That is Juvenile Moise. You see? Ted Kale in Haiti is bald head, so um, <laughs> Dr. Noblin can be considered. <laughs> Dr. Noblin, you can be considered as a Ted Kale. It's not the way. It's not the way we're thinking about Ted Kale. Is is. <laughs> so they imposed another person who had maybe less than eight percent, ten percent of the. The vote. They call Juvenile Moise. When his term came for him to end, for him to leave office, he said, no, oh, he need a lot of more time because they have him for drugs, they have charges for him against drugs, and so he wanted to amend the constitution to ensure that he had immunity when he leaves office because when his term finished, he cannot come back now. And therefore, he stayed in office longer than his time. And the same people the same ministers, the same police, the same security, they killed him, broke his neck, broke his arms, broke his legs, gorged out one of his eyes. You know, so th those are really rough times that we have passing through in the Caribbean. And it is no point for us to talk about, hey, we're celebrating that, um, you know, we have emancipation and so on. We're not em emancipated yet. When we think about what the core group is doing in Haiti, we have to pay attention that it is the same thing that they will do to us because we are just as black as the people of Haiti. And these people who rule the world, who rule the United Nations, even our CARICOM, I mean, we are CARICOM, I mean, I, I want to apologize first before I say what I say in there because our ambassador to CARICOM is here. I'm the moderator, so I can always come and <laughs> But, but CARICOM is asking the people of Haiti to just go and do a little election. They go quick, hurry up after the man die to do election. The people, the people need um, to be. Yeah, that's it. That's it. When you CARICOM, you finish. We can do better as a CARICOM because this is what is happening to us there is a CARICOM country. We are Caribbean people. We are CARICOM country also. And if we cannot even give solidarity to our people in Haiti, when it's our turn, we wouldn't get nobody to, to have solidarity with us. So thank you very much for listening. I mean, you know, 
there are two doctors that will give you all the information that you're waiting for. Mine was just a little warm up. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Pascal, for um, that grounding um, this, this evening. Um, Pascal did with the historical perspective, and um, that laid the foundation for us to look at other aspects and the justification for the reparations that we are seeking as, um, as black people. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't introduce the next speaker before I say something about CARICOM because Pascal mentioned Cap CARICOM. CARICOM, for a number of years, I've been trying to go to Haiti um, to find out exactly what was happening in Haiti. At one point, I thought I would have gone because I speak Patois, and I thought they would have put me on the... Um, on the team, and the Haitian government refused. They refused. Up to um, July, 5th of July, we had the CARICOM heads meeting by the right, virtual, and CARICOM expressed the desire to go to Haiti. And there was a statement prepared at the end of the CARICOM meeting, the chairman, Prime Minister Castro Brown, read, well, he didn't read it, but he gave a briefing on what transpired at the meeting. And there was a, 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 a statement prepared. And the same night, Jovenel Moise, the president, was killed. So that statement probably didn't even go out. So CARICOM is struggling. Now, the mention the group, the group, um, the group that actually recommended the government that is going to um, be installed. And um, CARICOM, for some reason, is not part of that group. The OAS is part of that group. The United Nations is part of that group. For some reason, CARICOM was left out of that group. That's, that's the way it is. So um, it's not that CARICOM has not tried to assist in the situation in Haiti, but first the government didn't um, invite us. Okay, but um, very good, um, Mr. Pascal, you, you, you gave us a good um, grounding. And when he was talking about the history, British history, I took myself back to high school. I did history in high school, and the history I was taught in high school, and the history Mr. Pascal um, gave us tonight is chalk and cheese, because he put it in the way we, we should look at it. But when we were at school, they told us what they wanted to tell us. We also did um, American history as well. So, so it's really um, interesting to see how there are different twists to things. Let me do a second round of welcoming because we have some very important people here. We have the Secretary to the Cabinet, Ms. Karen Prevo with us. We are happy to have you. And next to her is Mrs. Um, Hyacinth, who is the Secretary General of UNESCO. And we have Ike Douglas. I mean, what can I say about Ike? Ike has been in everything. He now is in trade. And um, he's part of the Group Reparations Committee as well worked on the work plan that uh, was done recently. Ms. Agpa, it's good to, to have you. Um, give my regards to your wife. Your wife, I worked with her for a long time. Uh, Mr. Stevens is here. Um, he's been in small business. Uh, he's a big guy, but he's been in small business for a long time. Maybe he'll be in big business soon. <laughs> and um, we have Ben Lundy for there, who's um, a colleague of mine working with G. GIZ. Uh, he just finished building a jetty, well, the company in Sufre. So very soon we'll have um, an opening ceremony. And I have a, a good friend here, and, um, Shabaka. Shabaka is here, 
Um, he's a, a member of the reparations committee as well. So, um, so I just wanted to let the people out there know that we have high powered people inside the Old Mill Cultural Center at this point in time. Mr. Winston, you are there too, you know. I see you have your exhibition there and, and your ex uh, um, no, I, I know it's not for free. <laughs> so what is, it's, it's good to have you and to, for you to exhibit your, your products. Um, so let me, um, let me encourage those of us who are here not to leave without buying something from Ms. Winston and, and her colleague there. She's hiding behind a nice um, bag there. Okay. So having said that, let me introduce the next speaker, Ms. Hyacinth. Um, again, I don't want to go into my phone, but um, she is now, she has her own company now. Um, she's a teacher. She's very interested in history. And um, she's studying, she's doing some studies in archaeology. And um, she is a member of the Reparations Committee. And um, I must say, she inspired me the last, the last panel we had. She inspired me with the kind of arrangement she had in place at a very difficult time. Um, I was moderating from my office, and I, there was nobody around me. And everything, everything went well. If there was a problem, I couldn't handle it. So I, I, used to, I used my phone, and everything went well. And I, I, I really felt good that young people, young people could rise to the challenge because we are challenged, we were challenged by whatever, and uh, we were all in different areas. And yet, we put on an excellent show um, for people. Um, Lloyd was a panel, Dr. Dublin was a, so Lloyd was a panelist, Dr. Dublin was a panelist as well. And uh, I was the much. So now we have um, upgraded Ms. Hyastin to a panelist now. So I introduce her and please welcome her. Good evening. I would like us to give our previous speaker a hand. And he did an excellent job in putting the attention to the reparations movement in his presentation. And he did well starting the bowling. I think he started the bowling with, uh, with some pace. <laughs> so I will be the second bowler. I will try a little off spin. And also, I noticed he gave me a doctorate. So I'm going to give him back one. So Dr. Pascal, you did a very well presentation. <laughs> So the reparations discussion highlights the atonement for enslavement and has linked the reconciliation between the victimized people and the beneficiaries' enrichment. Britain falls in that category of gaining majority of the profits from selling and chain Africans and continued to build the fortunes and power from Caribbean plantations. The laissez-faire method of management of the economies post-emancipation up to independence is also questioned. And we can also include such exploitation to this day and age. Wealth extracted from these crimes should be converted into something like a national reparation strategy. According to the Honorable Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt, we are in a world where the developed countries are enriching themselves with the toil of people in developing countries. The Honorable Prime Minister is right, as this is an action the British and any other imperial power have had perfected over 200 years. So then we can wonder why CARICOM was not part of that group. <laughs> Tonight, I'll feature two discussions in my presentation. First, I will present a surface historical analysis of the indigenous people and reparations, then the exploitation of enslaved women and how the system was used to condition their life and 
advancement. In terms of the historical analysis of the indigenous and reparations, during the 16th and 17th century, the Kalinago villages of Dominica would have consisted an inclusion of different nationalities and ethnic groups. Already, one is presented with an inclusive, an inclusive society, by extension, economic activity that would develop after the interruption by the European colonization. Within the Kalinago society in Dominica during that time, you will have found three sets of people besides the, the Kalinagos. You will have found Africans who traveled back with the, Afri the Kalinagos, the Kalinago seamen after their raids on other islands. You will have found Europeans, deserters on ships that stopped briefly in Dominica, or those who were on indenture ship and escaped, and those who were shipwrecked. And then you will have also found Maroons from local plantations. So by, 15, by 1569, it was estimated that there were 30 Europeans, and that is in one district in, in vicinity in Dominica. You had 30 Europeans and 40 Africans, and that's just in one vicinity. vicinity. So there already corrects the malinformation that was conditioned in our school system during the years when we received British colonial tailored education about the mindset, mindset of um, Kalinagos. That was that Kalinagos were indeed, they were indeed organized and accommodated and rather than a group of, or band of cannibals. Within these Kalinago communities, you would have found women, Kalinago, Taino, and African. Both natural, displaced, were surviving there. Dr. Leonard Sonny Church in his book, The Fighting Maroons, gives an account of an African woman named Louise de Navarrete. She was captured by the Kalinago raiders during an attack in Puerto Rico in 1576 and brought to Dominica, where she lived for four years. After the four years, she was taken back to Puerto Rico and she could recount languages, customs that she learned while she was on the Cardinago um, community. So what you are seeing there, that there was coexistence between the Cardinagos and an ethnic and African ethnic groups into each other's kingship system for survival of both. This coexistence thrived during the period in which the French and the British posed serious threats to the Kalinago community. Their survival was paramount. Though there were instances, and I know that sometimes, whilst I was doing the research, that was pushed a lot in the, on, the, on the internet to try to state that there was some form of disagreement between the Kalinagos and Africans. Though you had relations like that, like in instances where in 1645 and 1660, the Kaninagos would have generally took runaway slaves back to their masters or sold them to the French and Spanish. But what you don't see often is that after the mid-century when the Kaninagos realized that they were still being attacked, they changed that policy and they refused to return the Africans and began regarding them as an addition to their nation. The merging of the Kalinago and African struggles, therefore, posed the greatest economic threat in the enterprise of the Indies. That is why British wasted no time in adopting a range of measures to suppress the Kalinagos, because they saw that the, pre the presence of the Kalinagos and them helping the Maroons was threatening the interests of the plantation. The argument really now is not about how deep the Kalinago and Maroon relation was because we know that the indigenous would have passed on their knowledge of the island and, the, and, and of the environment and their survival techniques to the Africans. The Kalinago spirit of liberty and defense match that of the African determination to escape the bonds of enslavement. The relation was strong and many credited the success of the Maroon environment to the Kalinago involvement. And if I may be permitted for this point, to highlight some of our female Maroons at this time. You had Tranquil, Victorine, Rachel, Genevieve, Francois, Adelaide, Charlotte, Calypso, Mary Rose, and Angelique. 
So today, that is why we are able to still have the use of and keep some of the Kalinago names, places, animals, and things. This is as a result of the strong cultural exchange during that period. So again, I repeat, the argument is not how deep the Kalinago and Maroon relation was. It's how does all of this tie in with reparation redress? Why did the indigenous have to fight for their survival? You see, language, remember when I spoke about the slave from Puerto Rico and she spoke about the language, the Kalinago language? Language existence is a key indicator in the characteristic of organized societies. Other than, others include geographic space, government, religion, social structure, and art, which the Kalinagos had. Therefore, it is safe to say that the Kalinago community would have, would have been interrupted in their development by the colonizing by first the Spanish and then the British. So for the Spanish, when Queen Isabella, she gave her permission so that people who rejected Spanish domination and Christianity to be enslaved. In 1542, that decree was changed, and here it was changed. It was changed and called a new law, which forbade indigenous people taking indigenous people as slaves. But in her words, you cannot take indigenous Caribbean people as slaves except the male Carib warrior. So you can take everybody, all indigenous people, but not take the Carib warriors. To add to that, by 1569, they included the Carib females. And in other words, Carib females will be included in that excep exception. They use the word Carib because any indigenous Caribbean community which resisted colonization, regardless of their ethnic makeup, was termed Carib. Keep in mind that once you taint with the female grouping of any civilization, you are indeed disrupting the future of that generation. Now, the British, when they came down by the early 17th century, they came and instituted a colonizing policy based on violent land appropriation and disposition of the indigenous population. The British attack on the indigenous population was simply a case of racial, racial hatred to genocide. It goes far beyond, and remember in school they tell us about Las Casas. I saw a question recently on, a, on an exam paper about who was the protector of the Indians. There's nothing about protector of the Indians, Las Casas, right? It goes beyond Las Casas and his recommendation about protecting the Indians and recommending Africans. The British came, met the remaining indigenous there, and had to assert military control, social manipulation, colonial dominance to ensure that the plantation was economically viable. The Indians and, the, and their, their, their resistance threatened the viability of the plantation. So here are some instances. William Stapleton, and I refuse to give him his title, stated in a letter to the emperor of, of officials in London, and here what he says. I beg you to represent to the king the necessity for destroying the Carib Indians. We are now as much on our guard as if we were had a Christian enemy. If their destruction cannot be total, they must be driven to the main. That was his request. This was granted to him, right? Even before he received the permission, he sent 300 men to Dominica headed by Warner and he killed at least 30 Kalinagos on their first strike. And then after they were free who surrendered, they shot them. So that 30 did not include the free. After the executions, there were 60 to 70 men and women and children, right? And they were invited to the same honor that he sent to Dom Dominica, invited to their camp to have some form of entertainment, some fun, rum, right? And then once they were drunk, he made a signal, and then they slaughtered everybody, including his half-brother, who was a Kalinago. In 1772, there was a, another one, Laban, 
of Dominica. As I said, I'm not giving them the titles. He informed the British government that nothing else than a total extirpation of these poor infatuated would be satisfactory. First time I see the words extirpation, I researched it and it has to do with something that is almost a medical term where they actually go in and take out and remove, exterminate. This is the term that this man used to talk about the indigenous people. That is how so much a threat the indigenous people were to the plantation society. There you see that genocide of the indig indigenous groups was an economic policy of Britain. That is why in the 10 point action plan, the indigenous people development program that we are asking for is given priority. Because the interrupted development of the indigenous society was done through governments of Europe when they committed genocide upon the native Caribbean population. British military commanders were given official instructions by the government to eliminate these communities and to remove those who are surviving to another region. According to the Caribbean Reparations Committee, genocide and land appropriation went hand in hand. A community that was over 3 million in 1700 had been reduced to 30,000 by the year 2000. Survivors, as you know, remain traumatized, landless, and most marginalized social groups within the region today. A next group that was exploited were the enslaved women and how this system was used to condition their life and advancement. The enslavement of women attacked women as human beings. Women represented approximately 30% of the estimated 50 million Africans forced fully transport, transported to the Caribbean when the 15th to the, during the 15th and 19th century. The female is represented as a sex slave property, producer of children to increase population, all in a means as a tool to enhance the wealth of the slavery system built by the British in the Caribbean. Prior to the abolition of the slave trade, it was economically viable to buy first slaves from Africa. However, after the end of the slave trade, the view of the woman took an additional focus. A large part of the labor on the sugar estate consisted of holes, hold on. Yeah. A large part of the labor on the sugar estate consisted of digging holes for cane, hoeing, and weeding. These were generally tasks that were ascribed to women. I don't want the men to get upset after this set of notes, okay? But it's reality, listen. There were complex hierarchical divisions of labor that existed on plantations, and in some instances, the men were valued as craftsmen skilled or work in semi-industrial processes on a sugar mill. At least half or more of the ordinary fields in the armed gangs in the field were comprised of women. So you see on movies, when they portray the slavery field, they show a whole set of hard, strong looking men with little cutlers trying to cut cane or cotton or pick cotton. Most times in reality, you'll have seen more women in these gangs than men. On one point, plantation data, and this data was broken down, show the plantation differences. You had 92 women, 70 of which were field workers, 84 men, 24 working in the fields. On another plantation, you had 162 women, 70 in the fields, and 177 men, only 29 in the fields. William Beckford outlines the occupational differences between the sexes. He stated, a Negro man is purchased either for trade, meaning they have him there, and then they could trade him to the next plantation and keep that part where they, keep, they can take him to the next plantation, trade him, so that he can always sometimes be this, this absentee person. Keep that there. 
So the Negro man is purchased either for trade or cultivation and different processes of kin. The occupation of the women are only two house, two house with several departments and supposed indulgences, or the field with exaggerated labors. So apart from the midwife, the doctress, or the chief housekeeper, the slave elite consisted solely of men. Women were restricted to the lower ranks. Yet, the labor regime ensured that the women shared the same backbreaking work, misery, and of course punishments as the men. So if a man will get 60 floggings, the woman will get 60 floggings. So you can now start to understand that if majority of women were field workers, then numerous amounts of enslaved women were subjected to harsh conditions. Even while experiencing natural feminine occurrences such as menstruation and pregnancy, the field workers were treated as the capital stock on the plantation. This is on par with the animal stock and maintained to bear subsistence level. They performed the hardest, longest hours and had the highest mortality rates. The occupational differences between the sexes suited the running of the plantation economy. And then you can see this carrying well into our 20th century. Because for example, in 1906, the daily wage for agricultural workers were $9 and $10 for men and $6 a day for women. In the interior, however, labor was scarce and they were trying to attract more women and many peasant farmers grew cocoa as a cash crop. The rates rose to $10 and $11 for women. Remember, they're trying to attract the men, and the price for the men was $3. In a paper written by Cecilia Green, a recalcitrant plantation colony, Dominica, 1880-1946, she presents the following data. According to the 1891 census in Dominica, the census figures 81% of all Dominican women and girls over 10 years worked outside the home, a figure surpassing even that of Barbados. Women and girls made up of 56.7% of working population, a proportion which appears to have increased in the ensuing decades after heavy male migration. You see in a pattern. Remember, I told you remember something before, All right? Women had formed the greater part of the agricultural labor force for decades in Dominica and elsewhere in the Eastern Caribbean, but critical skill supervisory positions were reserved for men. Boys were solely beneficiaries of vocation, vocational agricultural training in the form of institutions. And indeed, they were valued more highly than women as workers. They typically received $7 a day to a woman, $6 a day in the 1900s. So they perpetuated that disparity. Another impact of the plantation was the placement of women as sex slaves and a reproductive unit. Before the abolition of the slave trade, the price of a female slave was the same with or without children. After the trade was abolished, the demand for labor became more of a priority. So for example, the price of a female slave was 180 pounds, but a slave with an infant would have had 20% added to that price. According to Professor Verin Shepherd, who is the director of the Center of Reparation Research. After the passing of the 1807 Abolition Act, women's reproductive rights became part of the political discourse in Britain, part of parliament. They directed their attention to the black women's bodies and their reproductive and the reproduction customs and practices and the application of incentives to breed and grow children in order to encourage an increase of the population available to be enslaved and to extend the plantation system. In the midst of extreme treatment, 
Despite amelioration, women face abuse in their bodies through these hard punishments and experience sexual exploitation, even from their own. Because what would have happened, for example, you would have a black slave driver, for instance, was appointed to carry out the punishments. This position was a privileged position given to a man. And it was dependent on his ability to do the whims of the master. And therefore, he being manipulated had to execute harsh physical abuse, abuse of a woman. Women were seen as productive tools, sexual pleasure and reproduction. For example, a house worker, which is a simple manual labor included the supply of socio-sexual services and the reproduction of children is seen as an asset. The saddest thing about all this is that the British law denied the woman of her human identity and as a property, the term rape could not be applied to her. So in that case, she could be likened to a plantation sex toy because she was a thing of the plantation owner. Then there were those who accepted through manipulation to be concubines of or sex slaves. If you look at Richard Dunn's plantation records, it was a practice that the planter selected the prettiest slave. And he quote, the master enjoyed commandeering the prettiest slave girl and exacting his presumed rights on her. This was their tradition. Another reporter said that the handsomest, cleanest maidens are bred to menial services. Sexual exploitation was so much a culture that in Barbados, young white males underwent their sexual apprentice with enslaved domestics and prostitutes, and the family organized that when they reached a certain age. In Dominica, many estate managers who were bachelors had mistresses from among the slaves and free collars. There were also rampant cases of drunkenness, ignorance, and prostitution in Dominica by estate attorneys who were considered to be lower class of whites. There were few in Dominica, and they called themselves distinguished gentlemen, who were against, who were against such lifestyle, and even commented. If you could see this one highlighted in the Dominica story by Dr. Leno Sonichich, and this one stated that it was better to have a wife than a mistress with the whole of her family connections have to be pampered and thus spread jealousies, rumors, and murmurs, discontent from the Negroes. And funny, Hitman and Octavian might know that song. When I read this, I remembered Cranium song, Girl Policy. <laughs> so, so many of our relationship and societal woes today are rooted in the plantation society. That same system of sexual exploitation, when further explored, opened up another discussion and a whole different lecture on the attempts by the British content creators in weakening the image of the blackness. As it was stated during that time, the degree of skin blackness would have impacted your beauty. The straighter your hair, the lighter the skin would have been the ideal image of a woman. Majority of our heritage elements passed down through oral tradition were degraded, as many strive to fit into this condition of the British society. Nonetheless, the enslavers were rewarded for their brutality with compensation to the tune of 20 million at emancipation. Women continued to be marginalized a further 100 years after emancipation and during their imperial management. The apprenticeship system in 1834 and 1838 gave enslavers a further 27 million. More than 46,000 claims were filed for the estimation of 850,000 enslaved Africans in 21, British, in 21 colonies. About 30,000 were filed on enslaved Caribbean people. None of it went to women who were left economically poor after enslavement limited options to upward mobility, 
And as stated before, the impact on the female population perpetuated a cycle of poverty. At the end of the European colonial period, in most parts of the Caribbean, the British, in particular, left black and indigenous communities in a general state of illiteracy. Some 70% blacks in the British colonies were functionally illiterate in the 1960s, when the nation state started to, to, to appear. This direct link can be directly linked to the undermining of the family structure and the exploitation and restraining of the maternal line. I did not even touch on how our female descendants resisted and never, ex eh, 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 never accepted enslavement. But as their descendants, us, we should continue to fight for their justice as we understand what they were subjected to and how great of an importance with regard to reparation. These crimes against humanity, unpaid debt to the region for 200 years of free labor, the resource extraction and misuse, exploitation of women, disruption of the family unit, mental slavery, culture of preparation and disunity need to be redressed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hyacinth, for this very um, interesting discussion on the role of women during the days of slavery. And although it's very sad to listen to some of the things you described on the plantation, I'm also aware that women played a very significant role in the struggle for liberation. And in Dominica, I know, when I say no, I wasn't there, but I read about some women, formidable women, who actually had to end up in court for whatever activities they undertook to support the, the men, the leaders in the struggle. So um, I noticed that you have a written script so I would suggest that the Reparations Committee should publish the, um, the lecture you give tonight. So thank you very much. Our last speaker is uh, Dr. Dublin. Now, what can I say about Dr. Dublin that you don't know? No, beg your pardon? Don't say much. But, I like to give a story, because when you give a story, people remember. Recently, Dr. Dublin made a statement about an issue that was in the public domain, and he was taken to task. As usual, there's always a group of people, if you make a statement that they do not like, they criticize you, they assassinate you, they, they bring you down to the, they think they are doing it, eh? they think that's what they're doing, but they're not doing anything because you, people cannot take certain things that you have. People cannot take your education. Nobody can take your education. There are things you have people cannot touch. And when I noticed what was happening to a great man as Dr. Dublin, a good friend of mine, I called him and I said to him, those people who are criticizing you, are not they're not better than you. And I'm saying that to you too. Anybody who criticizes you is not better than you. That's all they can do, criticize. They cannot do anything because they are afraid of people criticizing them. So they thrive on criticizing other people. So I also went to tell Dr. Dublin how I admired him, because people forget what they do, you know. All the things Dr. Dublin is doing, he can never remember those things. He's in a lot of things in Dominica, big things and small things. Of course, he's chairman of the Public Service Commission, a big thing. He's in financial institutions as board member, chairman, NDFD, he was chairman of NDFD. He's now in the credit union. These are things. But 
most things that are happening in Dominica, if you listen to people who contribute, you'll hear Dr. Dublin. Sports, health, education, you will hear his name. So, I told Dr. Dublin, I admire you so much that anything you in, I want to be in it. And, and I'm very serious about it. Anything Doc is in, I want to be in it. So if you put Doc in anything, remember me. Because that is a person you have to emulate, support. Because while he's doing all those things for the country, there are others who want to cripple him. So we have to support him. So I had a dream last night. It just came to my mind. Um, I had a dream last night. It's a, it's, I really dreamed it. Eh? And I said something to somebody. And the person didn't like it. And while I was walking in the dream, there was a crowd behind me. A crowd of agitators behind me. And I look back and I saw they were describing me. So a couple of people around me, they, they were trying to describe me. Somebody was telling the crowd, that is the guy. They were, they were doing all kind of, you know, this thing. Well, they were, the fellow was saying something about beard, but I don't have a beard. So I'm trying to think about why would he do that when I don't have a beard, but maybe he knew. So what I did in the dream, I pulled out something from my pocket and everybody scattered. Everybody scattered, but I thought I had a gun. But I just pulled something from my pocket just to protect myself, defend myself, to do something. And everybody scattered. And I, I left. So anyway, I just wanted to make that story because we have to support our people who are doing great things in Dominica. And it hurts, man, when you see people trying to bring them somebody who, who's gone they cannot touch, right? He likes African clothes. By the way, um, before I forget, you may want, be wondering, I, I'll finish in a while. I'm the moderator, you know, you can push in the moderator. No, <laughs> you may wonder where I get that lovely shirt I have there. It's from Gaska. It's a, a new company called Gaska. And they, they, they have excellent African clothes. And Dr. Dublin has picked up his stuff. But they have measured him here. They come and measure you. And they, you know? So I just wanted to say that. So you'll maybe see me with another one soon. But get your own. Because, you know, stocks are limited. Okay? So having said that, Dr. Dublin, the microphone is yours. And how much time to give him Ashton, since you're the moderator now? Half an hour. You have half an hour. Thank you, my comrade and friend, Felix Gregoire. Um, so while you're giving stories, I'll start with a story of how I got involved in the CARICOM Reparations Committee. CARICOM met and decided, took a very, first thing, let me just greet everybody present. I want to especially thank those who are present because it takes an effort to be there. I want to thank everybody who's there, all those who are listening. I really want to thank the craft people there. My brethren there, I just get my nice necklace from him. That sister there is a tremendous sister, Miss Winston. Yeah, example. So, in CARICOM decide they're going to form CARICOM Reparations Commission. I mean, that was a big move for little CARICOM. They formed it. They had the first meeting, in, they formed it in 2013. The first meeting in St. Vincent in 20. Later on, 2014. This man, they're supposed to go to the meeting. How many, how many days you give me? Two days before? Two days before, he tell me, come right, boy. I can't make it, you know. Check in, shh, boy. I need to, you're the only person I can figure out to replace me. I check in, boy. Two days. When I reflect, I check in, but that thing, too important not to miss. And they had a major activity. Too important to miss. Too important. To miss. 
there was a major activity this Sunday. I said, I pardon, I gone. And that's how I get involved. So I went to the meeting. Now, the, the biggest thing in the meeting now, I was sitting up front. And while I there, I seen somebody coming up to sit next to me. Honorable Bonnie Wheeler. <laughs> oh, my. That was just like, that made my day. Because he was, he was designated as the ambassador to, to, for reparations. So. so that's how I got involved. I came back. We organized the reparations committee 2014. Chair, vice chair. So, so while he pushed me up front, I kept him close. So I'm chair, but he's vice chair. So, so you don't escape him. But really, um, that lecture is, but not, but not a lecture. We cannot give a lecture. There's going to have a conversation. I want to thank Lloyd and, and uh, Ms. Harrison because they have, Lloyd started the bowling, Ms. Harrison came with spin. So my job now is to, you know what they call the, the deaf bowler. So I have to make sure that the good work they do is not going to waste. So I have to make sure I, I bowl well so we can win the game. So no batsman going to hit me for six and four. So I'm the deaf bowler there. We're going to make it happen. I just really want to thank the cultural division for having that discussion. And I just want to note some of my references, Dr. Lennox's only church book, The Fighting Maroons. That's a book everybody should try to get that really give you a synopsis of the whole Maroon story. Dr. Thompson Fountain's recent book on the Maroons and Polly Patulo, I did use that. Her book, Slavery Resistant and Defeat, The Maroon Trials. The Marine Trials was one year, 1814 to 1814. When you read that, it's pretty hard to see the kind of atrocities committed, but it's mentioned, so I won't repeat it. I also look at the Center for Reparations Research, which is an organization set up by the CARICOM Reparations Commission, headed by Professor Verin Shepherd from Jamaica, very positive lady and the 10-point plan. Earl Buske is the chairman of the St. Lucia Reparations Committee. That's a comrade that I've been around, veteran journalist from since this is Ruzi time. And he's still writing good articles. He has a radio program. So I always touch base with him to get some insights. I also consulted um, Sir Afal Louis book, Labor in the West Indies. That is a tremendous, tremendous book. That was written a long time ago. So Afalis was the first Caribbean person to get, to win the Nobel, um, Nobel Prize. So that's a book, Labor in the West Indies, you have to find. Because in his time, as an economist, he was already mentioning reparations. And if we had taken on some of the, the reasoning and explanations, probably it would have been, would have been further ahead, but yeah. Postings from, we have a, a reparations group chat, I know my, there are some guys there. Them guys posting, you have to be good to keep up because you kind of information that flowed in that steady. So all that helped in putting all this thing together. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to have a conversation and what we have established, what Lloyd has established and, and merit is that the that they made the case already. So by now, everybody should be convinced that reparation is the right way to go. And reparation is the struggle that we know. They explained how the British Empire, what they did, and the atrocities. And even though you might figure the British are nice people, but the objective wasn't niceness to people. The objective was wealth, land, appropriation by any means necessary. Indigenous, African, whatever it takes. Emancipation is interesting because emancipation happened August 1st, 1844, but that was what we call partial. The full emancipation was in 1848. Now, within that time, 1844 and 1848, just imagine you on a plantation working all your life owned, and then they just tell you, but now you're free, you know. You're free, you can, you, so you're free. Now you're free, 
We have nothing, no land, no money, nothing. So within that period, you have to go right back to work on the plantation for them on different terms. Because you're free, they don't worry about you, they don't have, they, you're not their property anymore. So that is the period they have to go through. So, so, so that's your a further exploitation. After adding value and enriching the British Empire, the mighty British Empire, really mighty, they were. So that further exploitation of four years, where they had the Emancipation Charter, which basically telling them, boy, oh, you can live in the house, but the house is not yours. All the crops you plant are not yours. That is always. And that is the kind of thing we have to go through. But the, the key thing is, there was always that spirit of rebellion. Nobody can convince us that the, the enslaved Africans, and I want to stress on that word because part of our reparations struggle is to change the terminology. So we want to change the terminology from slaves to enslaved Africans because you were taken against your will and brought. So, you, so for, from right now we say enslaved Africans. Came here, just, just, just picture what they went through. Take you from your land, put you on a ship, come down in the Caribbean, work sun up to sundown, and yet after all these years, you are able to, to live what we enjoy on November food, a culture, a language for generations to enjoy. That, that have to be a special and mighty people. And we have to be proud as descendants of enslaved Africans. We have to be proud and we have to stand up and represent. Some people might say, oh, I'm not African, I'm from the Caribbean. Caribbean, as Lloyd said, just terminologies that, was, that we learned and we just stick with them. Indian, we're not Indians, but that's the terminology. History books said, Christopher Columbus discovered. Now we know. How can you discover and you meet people there? And that is what was in the books, but fortunately they have erased that. So the new people coming up will know that it. You didn't discover. Let's say Christopher Columbus landed. Now, post emancipation was a very interesting time already. You see, the whole, that whole colonial thing was, it wasn't by chance, you know. Them guys sat down and designed, they passed laws. Now, when they pass a law and you say an enslaved African is property, you know what a property means? Like you go and buy a car. The car is yours. You can, do what you want to fit, if you want to pack it, you want to drive it, you want to crash it. crash it. That is your property, and that it was supported by, by the legal framework. So they established the legal framework to have the slaves as property. That is post. OBL laws. OBL laws and other laws were set up to ensure that the people, that the whole religion was. So when people have a concept about Obia and making us afraid, but if you did Obia, you have to run away from them. They use these things to, 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 to hold you down and prevent the people from expressing them, them, themselves. So it, based on the Obia law, if you had a mask, which would be part of your culture from Africa in carnival time, masquerade, all these things at the time they were considered as artifacts of Obia and, and really had penalties. So, so you cannot express yourself, you cannot think your religion. They used, Lloyd mentioned it about the Bible, they used really just arguments to justify. Verses from the Bible selected the slaves of the Obia master and, and crafted to ensure that the, the whole idea they want you to be subservient and, and, and obey. Interestingly, why we think that reparations is important, the slave masters will pay 245,547 pounds for their property. Now remember, 
it's legal, you know. So if you have an emancipate, that's my property. Legally, nobody can come and fight it because it's legislated. But the 14,175 former slaves received nothing. I mean, they received nothing in 1848. In 2021, and the descendants of the people have received nothing. So we understand why it's important and just and ethical for all of us to be in the reparation struggle. People think, oh, it's like so long that happened, forget about that. Yeah, so long it happened, but they developed on that. And our development was regressed. So what, what we're saying, in essence, is the descendants, you committed a crime, your descendants who benefited from it are to pay to our descendants. And that, in essence, what the reparation is to repair. Reparation struggle, I say it's global. Global recognized by the United Nations. That struggle is worldwide. It's a movement in Africa, in Asia, even within the European countries, they have reparation movement. There are white people who are involved, who are conscious, and they are part of the party struggle. Even in the mighty USA, there's a big reparations movement. In fact, they're trying to pass what we call an SRSH 40 regulation in the house there. It's being pushed by some black congressmen. And, and, and sometimes we think we are small, but I'll tell you that the, the, the CARICOM Reparations Commission move and that 10-point plan that we have, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about later, that generated a lot of interest, and it actually caused the, even the American repression movement to grip and move further. Even in Africa, people ask it, that 10 point plan, what is that about? And basically, they're saying, but that looks like a good formula that you can use. Because the reparation is not about money. Some people figure it's money. How are you go, ever going to value? The expectation they are trusted is impossible. So when I go to the 10-point plan, we'll see why it's more than about money. It's about your whole livelihood, all the opportunities that were missed through, through, through generations. I want to really state there that the reparation struggle started a long time ago. Rastafari movement, the Black Power movement, everybody are talking about reparations. We really have to commend the Rastafari because they were the ones in spite of all the atrocities and struggles that they went through, a lot of, a lot of guys got killed innocently and they kept the struggle every year up to this time. Through music, Carlos, God named this exile one, Mutabai Puanye, Bells combo, Pakinemway. So even for your music, your art, the creative arts, the whole question of reparations was in poetry, was being put forward in different forms. So, so I am here now as chairman of the reparations committee, but I tell people I, I didn't start it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's like a, a relay. I'm just, I just happen to be there at this time. But we need to comment all those before who started the movement. I play my part, somebody else and others will, will continue. And all of us have to get involved. So in essence, the way CARICOM Reparations Committee is, 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 is thinking of going about that thing now is to, so you have the CARICOM Reparations Commission headed by illustrious Sir Hilary Beckles. Everybody knows who Hilary Beckles is. I don't have to say much about it. That is a man that just, yeah. He's just a tremendous individual. When you interact with him, this man brain is just, he has this famous book, Britain's Black Death. I would advise everybody to get a copy of that, Britain's Black Death. That's a man who has gone to the House of Commons in London. And when he talked, the whole, the whole House of Commons had to stay quiet and say Hilary Beckles put in his points there. Well respected all over the world. This man in demand in Africa, USA, everybody wanted to come and talk at the university. He's vice chancellor of the 
UWE and doing a great job. So he's the chair. We have the vice chair, uh, Professor Verin Shepard, tremendous lady from Jamaica, historian. She also works, she heading some committee in the United Nations. So the structure is chair, you have three vice chairs, and then the chair persons of all the national reparations committee, like Dominica, Antigua, Barbados, and Lucia Grenada are members of that. So we meet regularly, the, the, the CARICOM secretariat gives support, so we meet and we plan from there. But each national reparations committee has its own mandate and plan, guided by the 10-point plan, but each country has its own peculiarities, so you have your own program. In Dominica, because we have the Kalinago, part of our mandate is for native genocide, which is added to the reparations for African. Because as was, as was rightly mentioned, I mean, native genocide was part. She mentioned the story where the, 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 the Indian wanna, in this place called Massac, that is how it got the name Massac because the half-brother of Indian wanna was enticed by the British, invite the man on a ship, kill them, and then after, come down and just wipe out. Just wipe out. You tell what the, what the Kalinagos tried to establish is that in that area, that independent Kalinago nation with their way of life, the British decide, no, we cannot let that exist because that's going to set an example. So that's why they call this place massacre because a massacre happened and they just kill everybody. They won't say, well, but I like a two-year-old child. Let me leave the child. Two years, one year, half a year. Gone. I mean, we're just talking about these things sometimes. It, it, it's painful. Yeah, it's painful. Painful. But we dare and we have to do what we have to do. So just to give us an idea of like a definition which, which, which was crafted for reparation, it's to establish the moral, ethical, and legal case for the payment of reparation by governments of former colonial powers and relevant institutions to nations and people of the Caribbean committee. So that is the objective of the, of the thing, and we, we add the native genocide to it. So the reparation you're looking for is for the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade, the racialized system of chattel slavery, that's where the whole economic and social system was organized, and the native genocide. Well, in Dominica, we have in Kalinago, in St. Vincent, they have the Garifunas. So in terms of getting a definition, reparations is the process of repairing you see that word repairing is the key word. Repairing the consequences of crimes committed. So you commit the crime and it has consequences. So it's the process of repairing the consequences, remove the adverse effects upon the victims and the descendants. So it involves costing of the damage which is not only monetary. And this is considered by United Nations as a crime against humanity. So, so the reparation is just because United Nations deemed it a crime against humanity based on the amount of people that was The strategy we are thinking of targeting the British and the others, research, because you must have information. That's why I say Hillary Beckles was so effective in fact, he was so effective that he was able to get the University of Glasgow to commit 20 million pounds because they, he, he established that the university benefited from proceeds of slavery. So he made a case and the university agreed. So they have an MOU, 20 million pounds, but that is to go towards education, setting up the university, you know, bringing it to a, another level. So at least you can see that it's not a struggle that's in vain. So it, so it encourages us to hear some finger. Some people might say, but it's, well, well, you might never see anything, but in this, in this era, we are seeing the effects. 
and the results, and we are encouraged by that. So research, legal strategy is diplomatic, advocacy is key, that is part of the advocacy. Re-education, we re say re-education because some of what we learn we have to, we have to unlearn it and relearn, put it in proper perspective. <laughs> Using all forms of media, youth engagement, very important, partnership and collaboration with civil society and others. I spoke about the Center for Reparation Research, which was established in 2018. That famous 10-point plan, which homegrown, set up by Caribbean people. The first point, we demanding a full and formal apology. Full and formal apology, that's the first question. Now, interestingly, just that apology had to come by, you know. We are written to the British, French, Dutch, because research shows that even the Dutch and some of them, Holland, they had, for all the ships, they had some connections with the slave trade. And up to this point, the British have not issued a letter of apology. They're expressing regret, we regret. Because the thing is, once you apologize formally, it means that you accept responsibility, you commit to the non-repetition and pledge to repair the harm caused. So they know once they apologize, they figure, boy, if I apologize, they're going to bind me and tell people that are selling claims that they have to pay. So all they figure out is the economic, not, not the, 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 the ethical and justified nature of it. So up to now, we can't get an apology, as simple as it may seem. So that's point one. The other point is Indigenous Peoples Development Program, which she, she mentioned. The funding for repatriation to Africa, full funding, we want to go back to Africa, go back to the motherland, resettle. Ghana had an interesting, Lloyd, when it was last year? Year of return? 2018, 19, year of return. When Ghana said, hey, all descendants of Africa want to come to Ghana. It's just a pity that maybe nobody from Dominica took that opportunity, but a lot of people from America and others took it. They basically say, come back home. Land, everything available, just come back and settle. So it was a year of return because they recognized the connection. The establishment of cultural institutions, return of cultural heritage. Because what we say, because of all this, these atrocities, all our cultural institutions were destabilized. Our cultural heritage, the artifacts. If you go to England, one thing in England, when come to their museum and, and um, what would I call it, documentation, you have to give that to them. They have, you go to England, you go to Pacific and you see statues of, you say, but what? If you just come and you don't think about England, you say, boy, that place is a revolutionary, <laughs> progressive place. But all the artifacts took from Africa, they have it in a museum, and they're making millions of people coming, going to this museum. So part of the struggle is some of these things have to be returned to whence you take it. So at least we can put it in our museums to let people come. Assistance in remedying public health crisis and re-education. It is, some study was done where it, it, it showed that because of the, the, the diet that was fed to the, to the enslaved Africans, that steady salted pork there. So that gene passed on for generations and you can make the link between the, the high incident of hypertension in black people link through that generation because I mean every day drink it to that salted because I is this thing the pork salted to preserve and that's what you have to eat because that's what they have. So health programs, public health crisis, education program we mentioned the re-education and the reconnect with Africa. Well the, the, the thing is them guys have 
be over the years control the flow of information. You growing up, all you would see is of pictures of Africa. What you see is train of big stomach train by the side of the road. They never show you the the, 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 the development, the structures. The, so it, it's a it's it's a deliberate attempt to get you to think. Why, why you think like we growing up? The comic books, cowboy Indian. None of us wanted to be Indian, no, nope. because it's portrayed that the, 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 the Indians, savages and wild. But is they came on, on the Indian land. They came to take the Indian land, and the Indian resisted. So they portrayed the Indian as savages. But the Indians have their culture organized. I mean, just imagine them guys riding horses bareback. I mean, you see in movies, they, they had their society organized, had their culture. So you come in a proper place, take their land, and then you ask them to just lie down. And when they resist, they're savages. But because they control the dissemination of information, and it's happening up to this present time, even more pronounced with this fake news. With Haiti, closer by, I'm getting closer. Why do you think our perception of Haiti is so? Because that is how it's manipulated. The information coming from Haiti is always about, up to this present day, I hear the news about Haiti. The news media, I need to caution. When you give a news, you cannot just take the news straight from, from wherever and just drop it on us. In this day and age, when I hear they referring to Haiti as an impoverished nation, and I mean, it's the same argument that was used hundreds of years ago to give you the perception, boy, that. And, and we in Dominica, we see in the, we live in the Haitians. We see in how they be, we see in the other people, the other people who have come here and have our agriculture on our level. You used to go market on weekends. Right now, we go go market more than any day in the week. And you get produce. You see in the women. I ask, I mean, something amazed me. I was walking up King Jog the Fifth Street. And I see two Haitian women coming up the the fans. I stand up watching them. They have their thing on their head. Well loaded. Them ladies in a serious conversation. And it's like, they walk in talking, man over in through the crowd with their basket on there. I check it, that is serious. Man, that, I was amazed. Conversation, walking through people, and the thing just sits on the head. Yeah, no, these are hardworking people. We have to respect them, no matter what people might think of them. These people have come to Dominica and have contributed. The Haitians, maybe almost 10% of our population. Dominica, we need more people. Oh, our problem here is population. And you have a people that, that need respect. The first, can you imagine? In slave Africa, the first free black nation in our region to defeat the mighty Napoleon. When you read in history book, they have Napoleon, you'd see he's a, he's a super. But when, when you go to Africa, you hear about Hannibal and there's those, those, those great warriors there. So for the Europeans, they had um, Napoleon and defeated the mighty Napoleon. Now, the thing is, because of that defeat, Haiti was made to pay. Can you imagine you, you're in a fight or you're in a battle, you win the battle and you have to pay. You win, you know, but you have to pay the band. So Haiti was made to pay 90 million pounds at that time, bro, you know. Haiti, Haiti could never survive economically because America, England, France, all European countries came together and just choked Haiti. So Haiti was, could never be allowed to develop because that would be an example to the other states. It did serve as an example. It did serve, but the objective was. So up to this present time, we've seen that, that mentality and our people, we have to be careful. We can't just hear news and just absorb. There is news behind the news, and there are sources that we have to check. So respect due to Haiti. We have to respect the Haitian people. Lloyd put it in perspective. I, I, I like the perspective because some of the things, honestly, from that angle, I, I, I didn't really understand the. But that is if you have to understand when things happen to the jump and say, oh, those people, this and that. There are reasons. And what we see happening in these modern times, folks, 
is a, is a new attempt at, I would call it a neo-colonialization. That's what we see happening. In Cuba, Cuba, Miami is 90 miles from Havana, you know, 90 miles. Cuba a population of 10 plus million. You have an economic blockade that, that makes no sense. Whatever you thought it would achieve, it did not. And up to this present time, 60 years, a nation right there, the American people begging for them to live that because they know they, they go make plenty of money. And you have that thing, a political thing, just so have the people. It don't make sense. But the worst thing is the United Nations I can understand how every year you have in a vote. In this vote there, if United Nations have one, 193 members, out of 193 members, probably 183 voting against the blockade. American, Israel vote against, Colombian, some others, Ukraine, abstain to the new vote. So basically it's just seven against. And and every year that happening, and you're telling me that United Nations cannot even implement and make a change. So my call now is for United Nations to review some of their policies because it, it, to me it doesn't make sense. What do you want to vote for? <laughs> and every time they get in the majority and up to this present time, you have the people, I mean, Cuba under real pressure with that COVID, they can, they're producing the vaccine, but just imagine you cannot trade. You cannot trade everywhere block and, and they pass the law that nobody else. I, I, I put a, a sanction on you not to trade with you, but if another company trading with you, I sanction in them because they have the power and the might. So basically, so that's what we see happening. Venezuela is exactly we saw it happening in Venezuela. You see, I link you know that folks because that is what's happening and it's linked to the whole repression struggle because the struggle is intertwined. I mean, it wasn't just stand aside and figure, oh, Venezuela in the battle. Venezuela has been good to us. Venezuela has been good to us. So we have to support these struggles because our struggle for reparation and their struggle is for a kind of reparation in a, in a sense. Technological transfer, we're saying to develop, you have the technology, let's get some of it at prices that can be afforded. And the last one, debt cancellation and monetary compensation. We know we caught up in a debt cycle because of the whole way the, the, the this, them guys set up the economic system that no matter how you try, no matter how you try, by you time you make one step, they five step ahead of you. All kind of organization they setting up to just put their own standards on you and no matter how you try. You're forced to, to put all kind of laws, anti-money laundering, thing like Antigua won a case for the offshore sector, won the case, and up to now, nothing can happen because it's, it's against mighty America. They cannot, they, they cannot enforce it. Game in turn. No, we're not among them bleeders who not in, in which part of America that work at the headquarters. Just because Antigua have a little thing, you're killing that, but right in your place. So it's not a fair world, but the struggle continues, folks. So that, in essence, is a 10-point plan that we're using as a template. So you see, it's, 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 it's not just mourning. It's all about a whole, the overall cycle and looking at all aspects of life to repair and see if we can get back on track. Now, some of the activities that we have done, well, we send the letters to European government, England, France, Denmark, Norway, Spain. Nobody have apologized yet. We have had youth rallies, forum for Caribbean legal experts. Um, very important, we have been calling for the teaching of black history and Kalinago history in the school. I mean, we have been calling for that year in, year out, and we really hope that something can give. Erecting monuments, very important. We need to commend the erecting of the monument in favor of the Negmao. But we're saying there should be a monument in favor of the Kalinago, but they were the ones who kept white Kubuli. And I, I, I've been always saying that that name Dominica should have been changed. After independence, 
we should take out that Dominica thing and put white Kuboli, started this indigenous thing. And if we had started it then, by now we would be rolling, but I guess I don't know if it's too late, but I would still hope that we can go back to an indigenous name. I really want to see a monument in favor of the Kalinago people at some. I know something was started in um, Punkase there. That was the intention. They started something and then I'm not sure. I'll have to get some update. But we need to have something. Naming and renaming. Basically, we're saying we have some names that of colonial names that may be of no significance. There may be people who, who do more harm than good anyway. The same set of people that were exploiting you and you have things named after them. So we say we have to review and start naming this thing after our people. We have enough teachers, musicians. We have enough people so you can name some of the things after their achievements. So it's a naming and renaming um, project. So you want them like Mao, names, Kalinago names, cultural electricity. Some, some of it has been done. Some schools have been named after local people. But we want that to be a regular feature going forward. Preservation of historical places of interest. Of interest for us in the, the reparations committee is that Barracoon building. We want that Barracoon building to be reverted to its original. The Barracoon building is the only one that's, that's remaining in the Caribbean. Where the slaves came, the enslaved Africans, straight from Africa, there was like a holding cell, and then they were brought to the Old Market Plaza, oil them up, make them look nice, put them on exhibition so people can come and, and decide, okay, I want that one there and, and negotiate. So a thing like that of such historical significance, we can, we can make a lot of money out of that by just preserving this place and having it as a place that people can come, history for the young people, and people can come and the old market plaza too needs to be a lot of blood flow there. That is really to bring me, as Lloyd Pascal mentioned. And when you when you read the stories, they bring them guys there and, and or bring their head and put it on a stick there just to work on the people's mind to prevent you see, you see that? You see that's what's gonna happen. So but that didn't detain anybody. Because the African chiefs, they were chiefs in Africa. That's what they didn't realize. It wasn't just, just like, like just to pick up one of the people. These were guys who were chiefs ruling the thing with the organized society. So when they came here, them guys never, never succumbed and resisted. Bala, Kongore, all these guys. So that's why they were able to have the societies organized. And the role she mentioned of the Kalinago must be noted in our history. The Kalinago and the enslaved Africans, the Negma, worked together. Because the Kalinagos were there, they knew all the trails, and so they worked with them, showed them the trails, the fishing. So, so they had that kind of connection. Because after a while, they just, the British just said, well, let me leave this Kalinago alone. I can't conquer them. It's like, you, you travel in a fella and you find my number. No, every time you come, the man knock it on his side, well, let me leave Mr. alone. So that's why the Kalinago were able to live by themselves and the Africans came and so we want to state that fact and acknowledge that the Kalinagos play a part and we want to even in these modern times to let the Kalinago people know that that collaboration between Kalinago and black existed we have to carry that to this present time so together as a nation we can move forward because we have been in some talks about this and that and separation we have been together we consult Dominica against the colonizers, now we have to work together to, to, to go forward. Um, we think we, we are proposing also the formation of a History Teachers Association. We are the fact that um, history, we have Lennox on the church there. We are thinking of who else? This, fortunately, this young lady is interested in history. There are a few history teachers, but we just feel there need to be a concerted effort, organize and get the right information so they can um, Pass it on. Serious laws that exist that probably colonial laws that are of no relevance should be reviewed and the appropriate action um, taken. 
So in closing, I just want to just mention some of the, what are encouraging us. I mentioned about the, the University of Glasgow. Now the interesting thing, the British have paid reparations. You know. The British paid reparations to the Mau Mau in Kenya, where yeah, there were some atrocities committed, and they brought the case to court. And they won the case, and the British paid. Yep. They agreed to pay 19.9 million to 5,000 claimants. So they agreed. But yet, they don't want to to write a, a, a little letter of apology to us because I guess they figure we don't have that that force, but it's 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 picking up. We also see that um, Lloyd's of London, which is one of the main insurance companies that was involved in the slave trade, they have agreed to pay reparations because the connection was made. The Bank of England, while the, the British government do not want to apologize, the Bank of England issued an apology because they realized that the direct beneficiaries, even the Royal Bank of Scotland too. So what we're seeing is, is, is a new shift where people are starting to recognize, but yeah, we, we, we benefited, so let's find a way to so through that mechanism, when they agree, then we're using the 10-point plan as the template. And that same 10-point plan is being looked in Africa, even in America. We have this CARICOM. The CARICOM Reparations Commission have serious connections with the American reparation movement in Africa. And together, we, we, we're going to make things happen. So um, I'll close by saying, folks, we have moved from colonialism to slavery, emancipation, independence, and we are the juncture now where the struggle is for reparations. So that is where we are. So basically we're just asking people to get involved. All information is there, find out about it, and, and, and just play a part when you have to. Yep, so that's my conversation. <laughs> Oh, just, just one point which I, I just noted while I was sitting there. And I just wanted to bring it in terms of the modern times, how this, this, the, 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 the colonial mentality has not changed. My comrade there who lived in England for a while would know, we know about the Windrush generation. That's the people who went to England, 1948 to 1971. They say about half a million people from the Caribbean went to Britain. Now, in 1948, there was a serious labor shortage after the Second World War. So they opened up all their colonies, oh, come, because they realized the colonies have strong people. They have a labor shortage, being rushed. And in this present time now, they're trying to pressure the children of these people who are in England, telling them that their documentation is not proper. But a lot of pressure has been come to bear and, and they intended to, to pass the legislation. I'm not sure if it passed, but we come back and help us there. But what it shows that after you use people when you had a crisis, the people worked there for many years. Now their children, you're telling them, oh, their, their documents are not in order, and now you, you want to send them back because you fall on that terror, you figure, too many immigrants from the islands around. And you forget that the same immigrants that, that help you develop. So, so I, I had to close on that so we can see that they have not stopped. When you figure you're fighting a battle and you make one, two steps, these guys are always thinking to survive and they, they're finding ways. So folks, we all in it together and it's not my struggle alone. You know, the Dominican Reparations Committee, we, we just, is our till now and 
others will follow and we have hope and faith that that at some point in time we will we will see reparative justice being served thank you thank you dr dublin for this formidable lecture so captivating conversation it was so captivating i left my notebook here and i couldn't come for it you know <laughs> okay but um there are ups and downs and um we're seeing a way out um this week black lives matter made a statement on reparations um it may come out in the public soon but they just made a statement on on, and then Black Lives Matter is a very powerful group now. So we are now going to open the floor for some um, conversation, doctor? Yes. Some conversation, dialogue. dialogue. So um, I know we have a time constraint, so you don't want to drag it too long, but um, we like to invite you to uh, make a contribution. Uh, we don't have a mic going around. I see um, Steve with a mic at the back, but that's a, there's a big carry on it. Um, you could come up here and make your contribution. Make a comment, ask a question as you know, precise as possible. Mike? Yeah, well, it's getting a bit late, so um, I think I'll open the bowling. <laughs> right. First of all, uh, okay, fair enough. You know. I want to say, first of all, I myself personally greatly appreciated what was said this evening. You know, very informative. I mean, I mean, all of it is not new to me, but sometimes you get a twist, which allows you to see something from a different perspective and have more meaning. So, um, Brother Lloyd Pascal. Uh, you know, the young lady, I, I'm, I, I'm not too familiar with you, but I've seen your face before. And of course, I'm Dr. Dublin. A big thank you. Just about three or four points. One is that this whole business about Las Casas, you know, um, we heard about him when we were in primary school. At some point, it'd be good to put the flashlight so we can see what role in the context of the wider church, um, you know, element. I would like to believe that that would not affect our, 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 our commitment to religion and spirituality, but we want to know the facts. So at some point, some better clarification on the significance of Las Casas would be helpful. Secondly, um, the, um, uh, Sir Arthur Lewis labor in the West Indies. Um, it would be good, if, uh, you, you, you know, you're recommending that text. I've heard about it, I've skimmed it, but I really don't have a copy now, but I think I should go back and read it, you know, because being that I'm in that field myself, it's always good to um, hear it, you know. You, you mentioned, Dr. Dublin, a recent publication by Sir Hilary Beckers. You said Britain's Black, Britain's, uh, right, right, Britain's Black, there. And, Knowing Hillary Becker, because I'm a UV graduate, you know, from what I know of him, I think that is one I will definitely get, wherever it is. <laughs> John Lu Jays or whatever it is, you know, and, you know to, to, get, to get a good understanding of him. I mean, Lloyd Pascal, um, I actually have a, a picture of the Declaration of Independence in my office at, at government headquarters. I mean, I lived in the States about 12 years, and that whole historical period, you know, where they, they broke away from colonialism in 1776 and they got their independence somewhere around 82 or there, about 1782. You know, it was in 76 was the declaration. I think you, 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 you where you're saying the dates, they may have been mixed up a bit. But um, very good, um, you know, example was set by that, by that experiment. And you actually read the text of the declaration, the, the main points of it. You know, I want to congratulate you for that. Um, you said something about them, Dr. Dublin, about your review of legislation. And I, I you know, um, again, it's good to say a little bit more clearly what you mean there. I mean, Ray Harris, for example, my colleague in school, just completed a major piece of work which was started by his, 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 his uncle, Cozy Harris, review of all legislation. So, 
there may be something that he may be able to assist with, at least get the terms of reference right so that that's not lost in the shuffle. You know, okay. And my, and my, um, and my final point is that on the reparations issue, um, you, you're right, um, um, Britain did pay um, you know, reparations to Kenya on the Marmar. Again, I don't have all the details, but I got it from a reliable source. And also, the, um, the Germany paid um, um, the, the Jews reparations after World War II. So, they're still paying, okay, fair enough. So there's precedent. So what we're saying is that we are not first-time pioneers and so on. That has happened before. There's legal precedent, and therefore, we can continue. I want to also say, though, that um, we have gotten quite a lot of help from the Europeans, uh, for example, under the Lomé Convention and even under, you know, Kutuno, and I'm sure, given your former PS agriculture, you'll be familiar with that. For example, when they changed the preferences for bananas, you know, bananas are sold in Britain under preferential market. When they changed to the, um, the, 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 um, the free trade, we got a certain grant, and I myself, I computed the, the, well, it was stated in euros, but I computed the, 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 the um, exchange rate into EC, and the grant we got from them was 54 million EC. And you can confirm those numbers with um, uh, Carlin Roberts, who is the NAO. So, and of course, prior to that, on the Lomi, we got quite a lot of help. I'm a former NAO myself under Eugenia in her in last term. I'm sure my friend Gregor will know that. So um, what I'm saying is that, um, um, it's not that they haven't assisted, they have assisted, of course. There's no price you can pay on, on um, taking somebody's liberty away, and especially some of the examples that you gave. And I understand during the Middle Passage, a lot of people were thrown overboard because they were ill or not well. So there's a lot of atrocities, and, and maybe whatever it is, their conscience is troubling them, so they give no other assistance. But, but when one does a balance sheet to determine uh, what is the, the, the net um, 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 you know, contribution, one might find that it is just a tip of the iceberg. So that, that's all I want to say about on this. Thank you. Thank you. I, Good evening. Um, my name is um, Shabaka Tomra, born and bred in Salisbury and everything like that. Um, I was lifted and taken to England when I was about 14, and I spent about a good 40 odd something years there. About 40 odd, 47, <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, I got there very ignorant, very naive, and things like that. Um, <coughs> And my experience, really, of who I am. Um, by the way, I changed my name. I reclaimed it. And please allow me to get my breath back so I can start to walk. Um, I reclaimed it because, and I won't tell you my slave name, who my slave master was, and things like that. But my real experience started in, on a plane going to Germany. I was also in the military for a few years since seen the troubles in Northern Ireland a few times and stuff like that. And uh, there was this book called um, The Voodoo Queen in the corner. Before that, if you had asked me to read anything, we would have a fight. But anyway, there was nothing to do on the plane, so I took this book, and it was called The Voodoo Queen. I still have a copy of it, and that's where my knowledge started. Um, what was in that book and what it was about, you may ask. Um, it was about slavery. And as Sister Heisen said, there was the prostitution and things going on. And uh, this sister was part of the prosti prostitution ring. But her role was quite completely different. Uh, she was assisting the rebellions and things like that. So she would sleep with the slave masters many of the leaders and get information from them and pass it to the resistance. And I said, why? That is dread. 
you know? You lower yourself to the point as a sacrifice for our people. And I said, yes. And since then, I've been in sort of, I've been a black man again. Basically, I was reborn. And the story, I went into sort of Pan-Africanism and um, joined the PHCM, attend lectures and read certain books. At one point, I had a bookshop in the UK selling books and stuff like that. That's another story. I started selling to the Caribbean, and unfortunately, Dominica was the only country in the Caribbean that didn't purchase from me. But I still left them some voluntary books so that they can put in the library. Then it was the old library. Um, yeah, where was I? So, and, um, and afterwards, I sort of, part of the PACM, I sort of bodyguard the likes of Marcus Gavi Jr., Queen Maud Moore, and, and the list go on. So anyway, I came, um, and then within the UK, my skill actually is telecommunication, and telecommunication and mass media. Um, in terms of your local loops, the telephones, and what goes from the local exchanges, go into the core network and modulate it and stuff like that. And then voice over IP came through, that was part of my skills. And towards the end, it's anything you want to watch, cricket, wherever you, in the world that you want it, I can deliver it. And my final sort of position as a sort of a middle manager in British Telecom was a technical design authority. So, so that was it, and then I decide, well, I've always had Dominica in mind, and um, in the last, I suppose, 30 years, really, after I've done most of Europe, um, through my works and stuff like that, because that was my plan, um, I decide it would always be a black country from there on. Africa, if I'm not in Africa, I'm in Dominica, St. Lucia, and so forth, and I prepare myself to come down, Disappointed that when I got here that um, my skills wasn't recognized. I came here to volunteer my skills. And at the moment, I'm working in a library, helping the children appreciate the meaning of reading and the benefits and building their confidence and let each one of them know that um, there is a natural genius within them that we as a people can mind out and stuff like that. And, and that is going on. <coughs> So, yeah, and um, basically, I put myself forward, but nobody come and said to me, what can I do for my country? And um, from there, and not only that, they ripped me off at the port anyway, so that put the dampers on things and stuff like that. So, back to the, <laughs> so just briefly now, um, I joined the reparation committee to sort of give my contribution and contribute in many ways and to ensure that um, we move forward on a positive front and uh, don't underestimate the anti-Africans, the basically the Europeans are no enemy, generally speaking, they have been and they will be till eternity. So, and I'll just contribute wherever I can and any pitfalls I experience because I've lived with them for many years and I have a reasonable understanding of them, and I've been amongst them in the hierarchy, but I was just more of an observer. And that's kind of me, really. Nothing much else I can say. Okay, but good evening to all, to one and all, and to the panelists. Um, I must say tonight I was very impressed by the information that was brought forth. And as the researchers know, there's many more, much more information to be revealed. Um, this is just a touch of the iceberg. As you know, with everything else, there are always links that still have to be, you know, connected. And sometimes we ask ourselves, but why did this happen to our people? Why is this? Why this? Why that? Why is it that other countries that never went through what we went through have gotten like reparation already? And why is it, why is there a delay? So it seems from the canal mind, it seems very, you know, like, you know, like, but perplexed. Like, you know, why, why is the delay and why is it only in one area it can work? 
But there's much more information. And as we dig, we go down a, a rabbit hole of history and information of even hidden information. And the good thing what Dr. Dublin and someone has mentioned, the British, not just the British, they document a lot. We have to start checking the information that they document. There are a lot of things that they have documented, especially but in the US as well. Even the, the slave trade logs, you could check the logs and you could see a lot of information that you'll never get in a history book. So I, I commend the committee and I just encourage you, right now you make me feel like I wanted to be a fat, you know? <laughs> so um, just continue doing the good work and I really hope that we can get more forums where not just this among, but you know, it can really go out. Um, you know some people don't really like to listen to the news or television or long documentaries. So maybe use different formats, you know, reaching from kids, even do it in a way to make them go and research, you know, and it, it becomes more appreciative in that way. So I just commend the work done. And I'm here, if anything, as well. I have some information I'll share one day. So keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Th thank you very much for, for the, those comments. Um, I want to say something in response to a point that was made by Dr. Douglas regarding reparations and um, that we have to be careful because the British giving us aid mm -hmm. and as do, you know, I've heard this um, thing from Dr. Douglas already before and I would like to, for the benefit of, 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 of building consciousness that um, we, we're not really in a situation of weighing whether we should ask for what belongs to us in terms of repairing an injustice that was done over history in comparison with a little bit of aid. The, the aid is tied up with debt and we are slaves to debt that we will never be able to come out if we are not conscious about that. So, it is true that we can ask for, don't be, don't be rough on them, they're giving us a little aid, and, and so on, but we need to understand that we are gathering information to build a case. The people of the Mau Mau received a judgment that the atrocities that were done against them by British colonialism, British colonialism accepted that they were wrong, but it was not because they were talking about aid, you know. It was because they had built a case. They had a, a, a legal firm in England called Lie Day. Lie Day was able to go down to Kenya and do all of the research and the interviews and so on to collect the information about the atrocities. And the British agreed that yes, we were wrong. I don't know if they have paid the money they asked. <laughs> there might be a court agreement saying that they should pay because they are wrong. Whether they have paid or not is something that we still need to find out. But the point is, the work that we are doing there, we do not want to dilute it by saying we're getting little aid. Because the aid is something that they owe us. We need to make a, even a stronger point when we are making our case about what happened to the Negmao and what happened to the, 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 the Kalinago women and so on that they still owe us how many hundred times more than what the little pittance that they're giving us for aid there. And also, we have to find a way to negotiate for us to get out of debt, because we are tied with debt. If it's not with them, it is with the International Monetary Fund, it is the World Bank, it's the United Nations. And those are the things that we have to build among our people, that level of consciousness, that we are still slaves in a modern day kind of world that we're not going to come out, out of that. So the example is the same things that is happening to Haiti. It is not far-fetched for it to happen to us. There is no politics in Dominica that say we should get us all the IMF and the World Bank. We, we, even after Hurricane Maria, we are taking debt from the World Bank for us to do everything. When the World Bank knows that as a result of climate change, what happened to us there, they are the ones who have used fossil fuels and those kind of things to contaminate the atmosphere in a way that it is returning back on us and destroying our people. And for us to repair what is done, we have to take loans. They, they, we, should, we should be in a consciousness where we demand for grants for them to do everything that needs to be done to repair Dominica. 
I, I am emotional about that because I don't want nobody to think that we should be accepting, oh, we must, we must be careful how we talk to the British because they're giving us a little aid. Now. Good evening, everyone. Vanessa Lisa Winston. Well, we're here representing the Arts and Craft Association, but also um, ourselves as black people and our consciousness. I think it's part of our consciousness that leads us to do in the art that we do and using our natural materials to create and uh, discover and explore and be innovative and also help develop what we, the, the tradition that we actually took on from our ancestors to be able to keep the tradition going, to be able to keep the art going. And tonight was very inspiring, especially when um, Mr. Mr. Pascal, <laughs> Mr. Pascal is so emotional. I love to hear him speak because when he speaks, he reminds he tend to remind me of me when I speak about arts and craft and the arts and craft industry because he speaks from the core of his being and uh, you know it's I was sitting on the other side and I was actually getting shivers I remember I actually feel like there were times when we used to do um when we were doing the, the Negma War play, when we started doing the Negma War play with Alex Bruno, and we used to come to the old mill to practice, and uh, may he rest in eternal peace, Algy used to play the drums, and when Algy played the drums, I used to dance, and it's almost like there was that spirit that would like take over your body while he playing the drums, and you go into that uncontrolled dance. And probably speaking about it, and right now somebody might say, "Well, what you talking about?" Now it's it's weird, and probably even me thinking about it, it was weird. It sounds weird now, but at the time you went into that uncontrolled dance, and you were just dancing and spinning around and elevated. And we always used to say, "But somebody passing next to us on the stage or something," because we a certain time you feel in that that breeze just pass by like somebody just you know pass around and i think the the, the old meal is well was the, well, probably the best place to have had that because you know the old meal was an old safe plantation history was one of my favorite subjects at school and one thing i admire about my history teacher was that she would tell us okay this is what cx required of you however this is your history. So she makes sure that she didn't just come and just, you know, teach us history first to pass CXC. She also teaches us about ourselves and our history and going forward. And I'm pleased because I can actually pass it on to, to my children. You know, and I, I heard um, Mr. Dublin spoke about the old market um, plaza and that is a place that I find that should be utilized much, much better than it is being utilized right now. Um, some persons may beg to differ, but I think that the old market plaza should not be selling any foreign craft or, for matter of fact, all the, all the, 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 the little um, sheds and things so that there should be probably more towards the side that we can actually utilize the stage and have performances and demonstrate some level of consciousness. And we need to bring that to our young people. Because right now, yes, I am there and I'm listening. We are here, but we're listening. We are the young people. So we have to find creative way to bring that to the young people because right now is their phones 
and whatever that is happening in America, that, that is dominating the minds of our young people. So through this and probably the, 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 the committee, we can, we can work together and find creative ways, innovative ways to get the young people involved. We really need to get the young people involved because they are the ones that, some of us are seasoned already because sometimes half of the things that, that have been spoken there in a lot of our adults listening out there, in their minds, some of them might even have turned off their, 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 their phones or their, their radios already, because in their minds, those things are gone. So we now have to empower our young people to actually take it further, because you all are going to retire, and then we're going to need persons to carry, carry forth, and it's our young people that's going to do it, and we need to empower them. We need to empower them. Sometimes when we even tell them about that shiki, they don't know about that shiki. Most of them don't even want to take part in, in the independence celebrations to, you know. You tell them about a, a, a screw pine bag and they'll watch you like, what are you talking about? What screw pine you tell me about? What? You know, but that is our tradition. These are skills that was brought on from, from our ancestors. So I just say good night and thank you for having us here. And good night again. Thank you, thank you. Yes? The mics, the mics are, are not popular at this point in time. <laughs> I wonder why. But anyway, uh, it was a pleasure. 
having this um, session this evening. Um, it's one of many more sessions to come. And um, as we're hearing, we have to um, diversify in terms of the, the clients or the persons we want to attract. So the younger generation is going to be important as we move forward because um, we are passing by, all of us, we are passing through. And as Doc kept saying, we make our contribution and others have to make their contribution as well. So thank you very much for coming and um, have a pleasant evening. Drive home safely. Hmm? Yeah, I was coming to that because you must pass there, you know, before go there. Although some people are passing there. So um, don't pass straight. Um, spend a few dollars out there. And um, it's all part of the um, support for each other. Okay. You can, you can come. So thank you very much. Quickly, uh, Emancipation Day will be celebrated on the first, and not the first Monday. In Dominica, all of a sudden, this, they, change, they change emancipation to the first Monday. But it's the first. So we're celebrating it in Hampstead. And the thing is, we want to focus. Everybody who come in should be dressed in some sort of African thing. We're going to have only local craft, local food, local drink. We're going to try to serve in calabash and, and, and um, banana leaves. So it's a nice African. We're going to have cultural performances, but everything as much as possible to really that whole African experience. So it starts from 11 to 4. And those who want to come, the rivers are there. You can go in the river, you can go in the sea. So it's a nice day to come with your family and experience that. Because the thing is, we never used to really have that emancipation day activity. So we're trying to get that back on track. So, so pass the word. Okay. Thank you, folks.